Artificial intelligence um, from the rainforest to the Arctic, from the global south to the north. Now everybody has an opinion uh, about the artificial intelligence, and as I see, there is a, a big difference between the academic discourses the everyday discourses um, uh, and the view as a practitioner, uh, as a consultant, um, uh, see uh, this um, uh, ideal landscape, AI. Uh, today, uh, we're discussing these issues with George Tilesh, who is um, a real influencer uh, on the field, the author of uh, of uh, a very, 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 very successful and deep book between uh, Brays. And uh, uh, from uh, his angle, all these robocalypse and, uh, and uh, human killing rabbits um, uh, and other um, moral panicky uh, approaches are, seem extremely different. How do you see? Um, uh, the AI discourses from your perspectives? Well, well, first of all, I mean, you, you've been trying to establish comparisons between different viewpoints. And I think that none of us, not even the leaders of this world, uh, are immune to being touched by the topic of AI first and foremost through the media. And for many, many years, the, the mainstream narrative of the media was that of, you know, Terminator and they are coming for us and they are, they, they are coming after our jobs. Uh, and all the illustrations to these articles were from the, those movies, uh, those science fiction movies. So that is no, that is no surprise that for many years, this has been the mainstream narrative, uh, and when the first AI explosion uh, started, I mean, not the first one, but let's say the, the, the one before the latest, uh, around 2014, 2015, when I actually started joining the scene in a, in a deeper manner, uh, I think uh, there was a lot of optimism, uh, I would even say bullishness about AI. That was the age when, you know, the Chinese Communist Party came up with their five-year plan and then 15-year plan of uh, becoming the leading AI power in the world. And of course, the U.S. has got into a, um, a reactive mode in that regard. And also, that was the age when, when Google and Microsoft and all the other big technology platforms started rebranding themselves as AI companies, but not just rebranding themselves. Uh, more importantly, uh, coming up with the, the short-term strategies of... Uh, of capturing all the major layers that is needed for for um, AI leadership, be it you know infrastructural data, hardware, software, and talent layers, they were establishing research labs. So if if we are jumping to the now, I think we are coming out of a long age of when when everybody could feel that AI is somewhere around us, it's somewhere in our devices, in the services that we are using but we, we have no power over it. This is something that is happening with us, that is happening to us, and we don't really have any, any maneuverability or maneuvering room to influence its, its course. I think the last few months have been revelatory in that regard that there was a, there was a lot of people, masses of people, hundreds of millions of people who got access to these new generative AI uh, solutions, be it, you know, text, image, video, music, and so on and so forth. So now, now the human is finally appearing in, in the process, uh, and it's getting into some kind of a driver's seat of, uh, asking AI to, to generate certain things for us. So I think that the discourse will change, but, uh, if you're asking me about the enterprise world that where I'm most active in. I, I think this is the age of uh, mainstream deployment of AI in enterprise settings, and it's the age of uh, monetization uh, and mass scaling of services, AI-based services, AI-first services by the big technology platforms. 
Okay, and uh, how do you see what are the most uh, convincing uh, uh, trends, uh, tendencies, developments, improvements, or innovations um, on the field of AI, uh, uh, which uh, can support to come closer to this uh, realistic view and forget these extreme opinions? Well, <clears throat> a few years ago, uh, I worked for a big public opinion data company. Uh, and uh, we started testing public opinion uh, and basically exposing them to certain AI solutions. And what we have seen is that at that time, when somebody is not talking about AI as a hypothetical only, but actually using something he, it, uh, he, he or she identifies as, as AI, then both uh, uh, with the coming of understanding, both the positive and the negative uh, aspects uh, became much more elevated. Mm, I think that uh, exposing people to technology and teaching them what it is good for, I mean, the current wave of AI technology, what it is good for, what it is not good for is essential and there is no centralized kind of uh, uh, an effort or initiative to tackle that problem. Now everybody's still on their own of figuring out what it can be used for and, and you know, uh, the, the conversations are being dominated by like, what can you use for your business with, with jet GPT and so on and so forth. So people are being bounced by, by lots of forces, primarily driven by marketing, uh, where they're still trying to find a place uh, for that. But we are living in a revolution of usefulness with a lot of early childhood issues uh, with, the, with the current wave of, uh, of generative AI. Uh, but I think that are the, the, the time for adaptation, the time for catching up uh, is going to be much, much shorter than what we are used to. Uh, it will be spreading, will be exponential, and we we have to become exponential in our adaptation, and especially in the redefinition, in the human machine interaction context, what we are good for, what we should be good for, how we can maintain the driver's seat, how, how can we uh, delegate some of our autonomy uh, to machines without being uh, without being hijacked by 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 machine intelligence. What we you suggest to um, open-minded students, um, um, teachers, uh, scholars, uh, and others uh, how, dealing with non-AI related issues. How to, how to smell, um, um, how to smell it, how to sharpen your senses to, to get the most important uh, news, uh, most important ideas, how to navigate in this information ecosystem? <laughs> that's, a, that's a crucial question, and thanks for asking it, because one of my, one of my pet peeves is that AI has spent decades uh, in only being practiced by a small circle of computer scientists, who, by the way, have been shunned and ostracized for many decades for working on something that was not deemed very useful at the time. So it's, it's only, uh, let's say, less than a decade ago uh, when, when the AI scientists uh, finally started getting the limelight they deserve because they finally produced results that were interpretable for, for business and government and, and basically customers in general. So what I'm trying to say here is that uh, AI is very much a general pur as a general purpose technology and AI being a technology rooted, but it, it's usually defined as a social technical system. Uh, it means that everybody, every profession, every field of science will be affected by it, or actually is already affected by it. It's not the domain of the nerds to, to oversimplify it. And I would highly encourage the, the practitioners of very different, uh, you know, disciplines to, to proactively investigate the impact of AI with them. Because just going back to the replacement uh, model that is getting soon, uh, you know, a, a scientist of nowadays, uh, be them from any dis discipline, will not be replaced by AI, but will be replaced by another scientist who uses AI. 
just to paraphrase what they say about lawyers and doctors uh, these days. So uh, I think there are lots of books that are <coughs> meant for, you know, informed digital uh, citizens who, who want to learn more about AI or at least understand the basics of AI. And I think that the crucial part is to to understand that the next few years uh, will be about the transition when when everybody will become more and more of a supervisor of machines instead of being the the active part uh, of, of or, or the only active part of value creation. And therefore, we need to adopt a new level of critical thinking uh, and understanding uh, the risks and limitations of using AI systems to be good uh, navigators of this new world and, and to avoid, I mean, um, I would say that the best possible scenario is that if, if the majority of the population, the majority of the intellectual elite is gaining the level of understanding, uh, you know, be them from books or online free courses, there's a ton of, you know, basic courses, not for machine learning engineers, but for people who, who want to understand the basics. So what I'm trying to say is that we, we should optimize and everybody who cares about this field should optimize themselves to a level of understanding uh, that they could use AI as, an, as, in, uh, as a natural extension of their intelligence, uh, as a good co-pilot for what they do intellectually and avoid a path uh, when AI is becoming actually the autopilot uh, and you are just tagging along in a in a in a situation where where you are where you have relinquished your responsibility to drive uh is it uh, a very very good message uh, uh um just re rephrasing your uh, sentences that you will not be the servant of the machine you will be the supervisor uh or ruler of um, uh your um, uh, machine uh, can you generate these kind of uh, messages which you think is important uh, uh, with a very, uh, in a very, very simple uh, statements which are somehow against the mainstreams? Well, you know, in the lecture today we were talking about the entrepreneur physician and I know that some, of, some part of that is unavoidable as long as people are calling their cars names or imbue them with, with personality. Uh, that's that's a, a very normal psychological fallacy that happens to all of us. But what I'm trying to say is that we, ha we are at the stage of AI when it is incredibly powerful. Uh, it, ca it can do certain tasks much better and much faster than any human. However, we are not at the stage when it can reason, uh, when it has common sense, when it understands context, when it understands the world in general. So I think that the most precarious uh, moment is to, to accept that we are somewhere uh, in between right now and, and we cannot accept. Basically, artificial intelligence is not true intelligence yet. And uh, nobody knows how how far we are from intelligence. It has a semblance of intelligence, uh, which can be utilized uh, every day. And we have to be very wise. We have to actually lend our wisdom uh, to the machines who, ha who are powerful, who are useful, who have a semblance of intelligence. And I think that combination of uh, human wisdom and uh, exponentially growing uh, intelligence uh, could be the, the good outcome. Um, well, um, now let's imagine that, uh, uh, now I've, um, I re restart. Uh, now there are big tech companies, uh, governments, uh, international organizations, uh, how they try to somehow regulate or redesign the scene where AI systems, applications, tools are developed. If you were, if you were the big and ultimate decision maker and designer of the future of AI, uh, how, how can you list your main points or consi main considerations 
uh, how to deal with these issues. So you can be brave enough to overwrite the existing uh, uh, narratives and uh, discourses. How would you how would you manage this AI design stuff? Well, first of all, I think that one of the roots of the problem is that it's a currently it's a constant race between innovation and regulation and it, it's positioned as like a, a never-ending chase uh, which means that you know some of the companies are playing catch me if you can uh, regulation is always trying to catch up a few years too late uh, there is a saying that you know most of the regulations uh, are regulating a situation uh, as it was three years ago uh, I see change in that regard um, uh, the EU AI Act that is coming is uh, has been praised by one of our colleagues on stage, and and I think rightly so, uh, because uh, it it defines AI uh, broadly, because it knows in their infinite wisdom that in two or three months time AI will mean uh, something completely different, and and um, approaches it from the the perspective of uh, the impact it produces on society and the impact it produces on rights, fundamental rights of people. So I think, uh, to answer your question, this is one of the most important things for me, that A, it should have more direction on the world that we want to build together. Uh, it's, it's always hard to come up with a regulation that doesn't stifle innovation, as many of the big platforms usually uh, call that out. Uh, but I think principled technology uh, setting uh, setting very, very concrete directions of how technology should go. So focusing less on like the what it cannot do, which is also super important. But I, I would be a lot more ambitious and courageous in defining uh, areas where I want to focus the resources that I'm putting into AI, for example sustainability or climate crisis this is this is an, an area where i'm my, my mind is boggled why there are no more uh you know robust efforts and not more more funded efforts in using ai to tackle climate change and there are some these these big hairy issues uh, uh like uh, i i'm sure you are familiar with mariana masukato's books so mission economy basically defining uh humanity's big challenges as different missions and 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 using AI pair them up with AI uh, and and provide progress uh, we had a luxury we had a long period of luxury while you know Silicon Valley was dominating the world uh, ceaselessly and without a lot of effort uh, focusing only on consumer technologies we are focusing we should now refocus on on civilizational benefits, big challenges of, of humanity that we have to solve and, and concentrate and focus AI resources to, to do that. The second thing I wanted to say very much connected to that is ethical and responsible AI has a huge literature now. Most international organizations have produced, uh, you know, ethics codes. Most companies have ethics codes. I still don't see it as part of the DNA of very uh, of, of of many organizations. Uh, even you know big enterprises I am working with, they produced the code like two or three years ago. Has it been operationalized? Has it reached the mind of a junior AI, you know, a machine learning engineer or even data scientist to to teach them the the sheer fact of like if we can build something, should we actually build it? That's the that's the most uh, question and issue and what to watch out for. So we have we have huge shortages in that regard. And as long as companies mostly think about that as a as a PR issue, how can we avoid risks and backlashes? We are not gonna uh, we're not gonna get far. So yeah, that's that's what I would do. I, I would be definitely much more ambitious on defining what it should do and what purposes it should it serve. And I would uh, I would be a lot more proactive on on uh, on ethical AI. My last question is a really wicked one. 
um, uh, if uh, as a consultant and a thinker, uh, uh, if uh, in the rest in your life you have a chance to get only one AI related project, only one, uh, uh, w w uh, with the most uh, endorphin making uh, capacity, which kind of project you'd choose? As I said, it's a wicked or a super wicked. Question. But I would certainly create uh, something like a, an AI technology powerhouse or foundry or incubator or whatever you want to call it for public interest technologies. So basically a suite of interconnected products powered by either a single or a single looking AI in the background. Uh, and, and I would, I would redefine, uh, you know, technology services. I would come up with alternatives to, to most of the technology services we are, or AI power technology services we are using. We know how they are faulty. Somebody just needs to do the, the alternative, needs to produce the alternative and it will find the, uh, the critical mass of consumers it needs. I hope there will be a lot of allied forces to fulfill this mission. Thank you very much. Um, this this uh, topic is uh, so we can stop any time, but we are not able to finish it uh, uh, to discuss and think on it. Um, uh, so uh, read first, check, find, and read George's book Between Brains, and see you later in our other podcast.